it's that's recording. Huh? So that's he he speaks Channel V, right? English. Yeah, <laughs> All right, go. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's Mike Ramsey. No, it's Michael Ramsey. Uh, Michael Ramsey. Okay, you prefer that. Why? Well, because it sounds more dignified. And you don't use your middle name. I have abandoned it long ago. Well, that's one thing Percy told me, you know, become known as who you are. Why did you get into criminal law? Percy, probably. He was famous in Houston at the time I was growing up, and he was the name that was always in the paper on the side of the people that were doing exciting work in Houston. And so I probably heard about him first. You grew up in Channel View. How'd that uh, uh, influence your career decision? Later? Well, Channel View was the uh, seat of the Ku Klux Klan at that time. And I have often claimed that I read the Constitution by the light of a burning cross. <laughs> I didn't think much of the Klan, but they were there in Channel View. And so I uh, probably was influenced to take the other side of the issue. That's great. And. Uh, then, so you did you just start out out of law school, or what did you do? Well, I went to went around to, to the white collar firms. Uh, I went to a place that sticks in my mind was uh, Butler Binion, I think a place you had some experience with, and I ran into Jack Binion there. He was kind enough of, at that time to talk to me. He was the most powerful lawyer probably in in Houston in the mid '60s. And I told him I wanted to try a lot of cases, and he said, I've got just a thing for you. And he sent me to see a guy named Bill Walsh, who was one of Percy's old partners, who at that time was signed on to prosecute the then sitting district attorney of Harris County, who was, who was Frank Briscoe. And all of the big time civil firms were defending Frank. So there were like 900 lawyers for the for the defense and me and Bill for the uh, uh, prosecution. And that's how I got a job working for Bill Walsh. That's right. That's really interesting because Binion was one of those 900 lawyers that was defending uh, Frank uh, yes, Briscoe. Wasn't he? he was. But he and Bill, Bill was, had a habit of forming a good relationship with the people he had, who were the, the gentlemen he tried cases against. And certainly the old man Binion was a gentleman. Uh, and uh, uh, so they were friends. And uh, I think Bill listened to Jack when he called him up and said, you ought to talk to this young man. And I think that's what got me through the front door. I remember we met, you were working for uh, Bill Walsh. How, how, was, how was he to work for? He was a good guy. Bill had a habit of every now and then have a morning cocktail. <laughs> uh, and so he would leave me somewhat befuddled on those mornings when we had a heavy docket and I didn't know what was going on in the early days, but it didn't take too long to catch up. And uh, I stayed with him for a couple of years and then went to work for a semi-well-known lawyer in the nation named Racehorse something or other and I've, worked for him for some period of time. I've heard him called Horseface. Names. Horseface, I, that's familiar, that's close. <laughs> yeah, well, so you went from the frying pan into the fire. I did. Uh, Haynes didn't have a serious drinking problem, but he did have a serious don't go to court unless you feel like it problem. <laughs> he, Which he, meant for you what? What meant for me, I was making $37.50 a week and trying murder cases. <laughs> and how was that? It was fun. I, I got to where I understood a little bit about how to try a murder case. It was a, a, a total immersion therapy. Uh, where I just got thrown into the swimming pool and learned to swim or drown, and, and uh, it uh, it worked out pretty well. Well, you and Haynes tried some uh, pretty uh, notorious cases together, uh, and uh, you had to take up uh, where he left off on a couple of those cases. Sometimes, sometimes he'd take up where I left off. We tried a lot of stuff together. We yeah. we had a routine like Huntley and Brinkley. Which, <laughs> where we would make a closing argument where I would say part of it and Haynes would just stand up in the middle of it and say a few words and I would say a few words back and we would, uh, we got to where we danced together pretty well. Yeah. How long were you with Haynes? God, from 67 through about 73 or 4. So that was uh, 
for seven, six or seven years. So I damn near starved to death. <laughs> well, you mean he didn't pay well? He did not pay well. He saved his money. Well, now, some people think that that's, uh, that makes you lean and hungry and gives you more ambition. What do you think? Now, I think it, what it did for me was uh, put me in a position where I wasn't getting the money that I probably thought I deserved, but I was getting any case I wanted to pick up or try, I could do it. He never was jealous about it. He was a good guy to work for. It was a happy shop. He was a happy fellow. I uh, had good animal spirits uh, and uh, never had a crossword to say. So uh, it was a happy time. And then uh, when, when did you leave and why? Well, I just, it was time to set up my own shop. I had won a case that uh, was a front page case that uh, gave me a certain amount of momentum. It was a capital murder case where we got a not guilty verdict. Not many of those. Not a lot of them. But, but over the years, I've gotten a few of them. And that was a, probably, that was the first one where I tried a capital case and got a not guilty verdict. It was called Aureliano Silva. It was a kid, a Mexican kid, who was accused of uh, uh, killing a blonde lady at a model home in the outskirts of Houston. It was highly celebrated. He incidentally didn't do it which didn't mean much to the sheriff's office or the Houston uh, prosecutors at that time. Talk about prosecutors. Uh, what's your feeling about prosecutors? I, back in the old days that we're talking about now, I never met one. I didn't find one way or another to like, or at least most of them. Uh, they're good guys who are going to turn honest and become defense lawyers at some time in their life. Uh, generally speaking, they're uh, a good prosecutor, a dangerous prosecutor is an honest prosecutor. And in those days, most of them will tell you just exactly like it was and you could put their money in the bank. These days, it has become so partisan uh, that it is uh, hard to find a prosecutor to really like. Uh, you know, prosecutors uh, often try to use nowadays their the, the strength of their office uh, to coerce pleas and uh, a lot of young lawyers find that uh, difficult to fight. What, what's your advice to some young lawyer that takes a case? Uh, how should they treat that case? They should treat the case as a trial case from day one. Why now, not to say that you don't settle occasionally. You settle cases, you do. Uh, but uh, we've been through a period in the federal system in particular where with the guidelines giving the leverage that they gave to the prosecution to to follow either file 5k1 or not uh, and taking it away from the judges that so we've bred a generation of judges who don't know how to sentence in a case or don't know how to try a case without the guidelines coming into conflict we've got to re-educate a whole generation of federal judges and they are difficult to educate uh, they're hard-headed by nature and life tenured and I think they fear the notion of having to do the sentencing uh, without without the guidelines. Mm -hmm. So uh, to get back to what to tell the kid who's just starting to practice law, try your case. You know, uh, you mentioned the guidelines, and the guidelines have institutionalized snitching. You get oh. you know, the only way you get a reward is by snitching. What do you, what's your theory about that? What's your philosophy about that? Well, it. It, it, it is. If I have said often that if people at large, citizens at large, actually knew what we do in the federal litigation of cases, as far as rewarding snitches are concerned, rewarding people who commit perjury is concerned, uh, they would strangle us in our sleep. Uh, they would rise up, and we'd have another system. Because what we've got going right now. Uh, in particular, under the guidelines, at least what, what remains of the guidelines, which many judges believe are still not just advisory but are mandatory, uh, is, is not justice. You say uh, the system encourages perjury, the guidelines is Well, as I say, in a subtle way, what happens is I've got, I represent John Smith. You're the prosecutor. 
I go to say, I represent John Smith. What can John Smith do to help himself? He's exposed to 20 years without parole. Well, if John, you tell me, well, if John Smith could remember that it was daylight instead of dark on the day that he thought it was dark, I'd probably will be willing to recommend that he get out of here with about a year and a half to do, or maybe less than that. Go back and talk to him and see if he can remember. So I go back and talk to John, and I said, don't support perjury. I just say, John, I want you to pray over this a little bit. You're going to do 20 years if it's daylight, but maybe probation or, or just a couple of months in case it was dark. Uh, why don't you go home and pray tonight about whether it was daylight or dark? And you'd be surprised at how many people uh, have an epiphany under those circumstances and remember the very contrary of what their story started off to be. Now that's, uh, let's get on a little brighter side of it's the practice hard. of law. It, it, it is hard now. Uh, what's the most fun you've ever had in the courtroom? Oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you and I trying the first case. I mean, <laughs> I, that, was, uh, that was fun. That was a case that we shouldn't have won. Uh, according to the bookmakers, uh, but we had a good client, we had a good set of facts, uh, we had a comfortable place to work, we weren't working really extremely long hours, we were, if I may say, we had money enough to in the bank to send a jet airplane to get a witness out of South Carolina if we needed to, which we happened to do. Uh, cases like that. If you don't really lust to go to court, if you don't really want to go and and mix it up in a courtroom, you got no business in this game. Uh, you, you need to get up out of bed in the morning wanting to go toward the courtroom, toward a scuffle. Just like a football player may get paid a lot of money, but he still loves the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds like you've loved the game. I have. It has been good to me over the years. and. Uh, I have always, uh, and I think because I worked probably for Haynes, he had the same attitude of walking into a courtroom and being happy to be there and uh, enjoying his work. I think that was contagious. I think Houston, by the way, has got a pretty good defense bar, better than most bars in the, in the nation, because of the spade work that was done by Percy Foreman and Richard Haynes. I was going to ask you what you thought about that. Compare Dallas with Houston. Well, there's not any way to compare. Uh, <laughs> the lawyers, though. Uh, the, uh, the Houston bar has always had a, a rebel element to it, a rowdy element to it that was ready to mix it up to go and try a jury case, whereas Dallas and many of the other larger cities in well, small towns, for that matter, also are more in the nature of we want to settle the case before we ever find out what the facts are. Let's get back to Durst for a second. Uh, that got the biggest grin of all uh, in this thing. Let me ask you a, a kind of ticklish question. Why didn't you want to find the head? Why did I not want to find the head? <laughs> I had mixed feelings about the head. I thought that it, we, we were probably in better shape without a head surfacing in that case, just so the jury would have something to think about. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I didn't, I didn't feel we needed to spend a lot of time dragging the bay. I thought we, we, we when, once you've got a case in shape where you know it's in good shape and you know it's time to get it to the jury, then quit messing with it. Take it to the jury. Quit. Don't over-try it. Don't overdo it. Don't over-investigate it once you've got it locked in. And in that situation, we had it pretty well locked in so far as the case was concerned, if we could get the right jury. And we had the right jury. We um, uh, had psychiatric and psychological testimony waiting in the wings. Mm -hmm. Uh, why didn't we use that? I think it was just would have been a confusing element. It would have been, it would have been an excuse. It would have looked like we were trying to excuse that which was justified under the law. We were justified in the shot that was fired. We were justified by all the circumstances surrounding the firing of the shot. 
why confuse things by, by offering a lame excuse uh, that the prosecution is going to say, well, he's a rich man, he can hire any doctor in the world to come and say he's sick. He didn't need to say he was sick. He needed to say he acted in self-defense. Uh, and that's what he did say. By the way, we, we're congratulating ourselves. We had a pretty good testifying defendant in that case. And that was, uh, leads me to my next question. You and I have sometimes differed on our philosophies about whether to use the accused in his own defense as a witness. Uh, what, explain your philosophy about that. Well, I've always leaned towards keeping the guy off the stand because I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a control freak, and I don't like to put all the, all, uh, I don't want to put all the money in one pot. And you put a defendant on the stand, in my view, is win or lose with his testimony. You're, it's, you're all in at that point. If there's a way to try the case without exposing him to the stand, I've always leaned in that direction. Now, I put a hell of a lot of people on the stand. And, you know, there's the old saying of uh, you, you don't testify, you, you don't talk, you don't walk. Uh, you have leaned over the years probably a little bit more toward putting the guy up there and let him tell his story and let the jury sort it out. I don't think there's much difference between us. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a question of a, of a shadow. Uh, let's talk about young lawyers coming up now and uh, the kind of advice you would have for them. Um, You've, uh, you've been practicing 45 years, almost 50 years, mm -hmm. and you've got a lot of wisdom to pass on to young lawyers. Let's, let's talk about that. Trust juries and mistrust judges. Okay. Uh, go pick a jury and try your case to a jury. Uh, we have got the, the Texas system of selecting a judiciary just, just terrible on the state side. Nobody knows who to vote for. And we end up with a bunch of people on the bench that would otherwise starve to death if they had to practice law. Uh, on the federal side, we end up with people who, generally speaking, have no experience in, or interest in the criminal law, who look at it as less than gentlemanly to start with, and are just not interested in anything other than making the railroad run on time. Uh, Juries, on the other hand, come down to the courthouse to see a show. They want to see a fight. They come down not to watch a game of canasta, they come down to watch a murder trial. And if you pick the right jury and present it to them in the right fashion, uh, juries can still be mighty instruments for the defense. But that, uh, this is not an argument with that, that puts a lot of the weight uh, for success on the lawyer himself and, the, and how that lawyer can uh, influence the jury. Sure. Talk about uh, the ability to influence the jury. What well, does that that, that's what lawyers do. And, and I, I think to, to one extent or another, uh, and this is not to pat anybody on the back, certainly not myself, I think this is something that you probably are born to. You learn a lot. Uh, if you have the talent to start with, but there's some people who are just born without the talent. But to go to go to the way that uh, a young lawyer should look at training himself is go watch lawyers work. Find a way, if you've got to do it for free, to set second to a good lawyer throughout a trial. If you've got to you carry his briefcase, do it. Uh, but watch good lawyers work, because you don't learn in law school, you don't learn in moot court. You learn when you're down there in the mud and the blood and the beer and actually doing it in the pit uh, how to try a case. Percy uh, always did that, and uh, Haynes has done it all of his career. Uh, you have also. How much, uh, how important is it that the jury focus on what the lawyer's doing as opposed to, say, the facts or the witnesses? Well, it depends on what the facts are. <laughs> Uh, if the facts are not too favorable, uh, you've got to find a way to put on a dog and pony show. There are other times when you can be just Mr. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and get it on and off and to the jury in, in two or three days. Uh, but it, it, the way you try a case depends upon the script 
And the script is not something that you sit down and write like Tennessee Williams. It's written for you. You have to pull it together. I mean, we have such a great profession. This is, is a kind of profession that most men only dream of, to quote Merle Haggard. Uh, we're given bits and pieces of the story. We pull them together and make them into a cohesive story and then get to go down in front of a captive audience and sell that story to a group of citizens uh, in a courtroom. What well, could be more fun? <laughs> I think you called it once the only game in town. It is. It is the best game in town. Uh, it, it's, uh, if you really want to play for high stakes, it's a lot better than hold them. <laughs> so, uh, you're not at the end of your career. You're at one of the, the highlights of your career now. What's next for you? I'm writing a book right now. I'm not, I, 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 wanna, I don't want to warn the lawyers that are coming after me. <laughs> You'd never know when it's going to happen to you. It happened to me in the middle of the Enron case representing Ken Lay. All of a sudden, my heart decided to attack me. You know, it, and it feels like it's treason going on in your body when your body is not doing what I thought I was just having a couple of bad days. And then I finally told Ron Woods at the table one day, I think I had a heart attack. And it, uh, so what I'm trying to get around to saying is that leave enough time at the end of the day. If you've got other things that you want to do, you never know when, it's gonna, when you're going to come to the end of the string. You think you're going to last forever. You never consider the notion that your health might fail. Uh, but when it does fail, then all of a sudden the game is not quite as much fun as it once was. And you want to leave a little bit of time to do something for yourself at the end of the day and for your family. So that's what you're doing now. That's what I'm doing now. And I have said that I might go back into a state courthouse someday but it'd take about a million dollars to get me through the threshold, just just to get in the courtroom. I'm not counting the trial. You know, that's uh, it's interesting that you should say that because the, the courts have changed, the judges have changed. Oh God, yes. Uh, you know, in the few minutes that we've got left of this, talk about that. How have the judges changed? From well, they're all ex-district attorneys, and all of them run as Republican law and order candidates, and most of them are the female types that are Debs for Justice kind of thing that that just is just is a degrading experience to go into a courtroom where it, it is set up to be a railroad. It is set up to be a meat grinder. Now you there are ways to stop it. There are ways to 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 uh, put some rocks in the meat grinder and get the thing stopped. But it's not as much fun as it once was. Uh, in particular where you have to do it repeatedly. Uh, so I don't think as much of our judiciary now as I did 40 years ago. Back in those days it was an honor to be a judge. Now it's just just uh, another job of work. How has uh, elected uh, judges, how, how has the elective system affected what we end up with? You know, I, I thought, Dick, I'd never say this, but I, I really believe that our federal judiciary is better than our state judiciary. I, I've always been a screamer from the left side, left side of the plate. I've always been uh, a liberal in my views, and therefore I've always thought in terms of the people should elect, directly elect their representatives and their judges and whatnot. But there's so many names on the ballots in the big cities now that nobody's got a chance to win without big money, and big money only means corruption. So I think probably the appointed system is better. I hate to say that. I hate to eat my own words, but uh, I, I believe that our, for example, just in the Houston division of the Southern District of Texas, I think our federal bench, bad as it is, uh, is better than our state bench. In order to be re-elected, uh, a judge has to do something to stand out, uh, to make the name known. Um, well, yeah, there's some some things even lawyers are not willing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, some of the some of the tricks that judges play, that's novel sentencing and things of that sort. 
are things that I think should be beneath the dignity of the court. Well, uh, it's been a great pleasure to uh, give you your reign and, and uh, let you talk. Okay. You know, what else do you want to say? I don't have anything else to say. Oh, yeah, you do. I want to go in and get my award. <laughs> I'm going to get to be uh, Michael, thank you. Now. Okay. It's been a pleasure to be your friend all these years. Okay, and it has been. Okay. Let's go. Let's go to the ceremony. All right. What are we, what's going to happen in next? Next, we're going downstairs.